could just build one message upon another today that we might leave here absolutely transformed as men. We ask it in Jesus' name and all men, all men who love the Lord said, Amen. Amen. Listen, now the message today is entitled this, and I tell you that it's entitled because through prayer and seeking God, this is the message for us this afternoon. And the question is put before us in the message, and it's this, are you waiting? Are you waiting? Right now, the message today is not for the non-believer. If you're, if you're not a Christian today, you've had multiple opportunities to make a decision. My message this morning or this afternoon is to the believer. Now listen, if you're not a believer, by the end of this message, you should become one. You cannot give me or anybody around you one good reason why you're not a follower of Jesus Christ today. But I pray that you'll listen to what I'm speaking to the Christian man about this afternoon. It's Dr. A.J. Ironside who says in one of his commentaries that there was a young boy who would visit his grandma and grandpa's house and they had a grandfather clock. Some of you might remember a grandfather clock. And that little kid loved the chiming of that clock and he would count it every time he heard it starting, he would run to that big grandfather clock and he would just watch and listen as it would chime. And uh, one of the days he was standing there, it was 12 noon, and that clock is chiming, and it's chiming, and that little guy's 9, 10, 11, 12, and he gets ready to walk away. The clock strikes 13, 14, 15, it just kept going. And that little guy ran into Grandma and Grandpa's uh, room and said, Grandma, Grandpa, listen, listen, it's lighter than it's ever been before. And you look around the world right now, and we see all of these prophetic scenarios being set up. And I want to challenge the Christian man today. We've got issues in China. We've got issues in the Middle East. We've got issues economically around the world. We've got all of these things that are happening more and more. Too many to count right now that the Bible is warning us that we're living in what's called the last days. You don't even have to be a Christian today to sense something's up. Time is running out. And the challenge to us this afternoon is what kind of Christian men are we going to be when Jesus Christ comes? Every generation of believers for the last 21 centuries have believed that Christ would come in their generation. You might say to me, well, look, all those generations were wrong. The Bible commands us to wait and to be watching. We'll see this in a moment. Don't think because Christ hasn't come back yet that he's not coming back. Wake up. We are so much closer to his return for the church. So close. And the world is showing us regarding the events that are taking place. Listen, the Bible says in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, regarding us being ready and waiting. The Bible says that we're to be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The question is, are you waiting? Are you urgently concerned that Christ can come back today? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning in verse 1, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Listen carefully, guys. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in the darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. The Bible requires that the Christian man be watching and be ready to be Jesus. Guys, I want to encourage you. I know you come from all kinds of different churches, but I want you to read the Bible. I don't care if you're Catholic. I don't care if you're Lutheran, Methodist. I don't care if you go to Calvary Chapel. Listen, you need to read the Bible. What does the Bible say? Not what your denomination says. What does the Bible say? And are you challenged by the sermons you hear, by the Bible that you're reading, that you are to be waiting for Jesus' return? And I'm not talking about the kind of waiting that just puts you up on top of the roof and you're good for nothing. Your, your mind is in the heavens. Christ is going to come back. I'm just going to sit around. No, I do not believe that. I believe that if you believe Christ is coming back, you'll be busy about your father's business. Amen, guys? Christ is coming back and we are to be engaged. And we're going to talk about how... This afternoon, Jesus says, Watch therefore, for you do not know neither the day or the hour in which the Son of Man returns. So here we go. Number one, mark it down if you're taking notes. 
committed to memory. We are to be men of faith. If Christ is coming back, the only way that you and I can wait rightly is to be men of faith. And it's going to require this. Guys, listen. There's no substitute for you and I to be in the Word of God. No substitute. you got to pick it up. you got to read it. I know reading is going out the window these days. People are not reading. They're not buying books like they used to. Listen, whatever. I know this. The Bible says that we need to read the Bible. The Bible says we need to know the Bible. Faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing. Hearing the Word of God. You might say, well, Jack, I've got faith. I've got faith in faith. I, I go to a church that's all about faith. Have enough faith in you. Have enough faith. Just claim it. Just speak it. Just say it. Believe you can do it. I'm not talking about that kind of faith. I'm talking about the object of your faith being Jesus Christ. What does this word say to you? Throughout the Bible, the Bible challenges us to be watching and to be waiting. We're going to have to be men of faith. Jesus said, let your waist be girded about. Now, I know we don't think like that anymore. But in other words, uh, we would say today, put belt a, a, a belt on your pants. Pull your pants up and put a belt on. <laughs> Amen. Gird up your loins. And your lamps. He says to have your lamps burning. And you yourselves be men who wait for their master. I can say amen to that and walk off the stage right now. Jesus said, be men who are waiting for his master, for their master. He says that when his master returns and knocks, that you may be open to him immediately. Jesus said that faith is going to be experienced and known by our waiting and by our watching. And we're going to look at it in three ways regarding being men of faith. Number one, listen up guys, we all need to hear this. If we're going to be men of faith, we need to understand that our past, guys, is in the past. By faith, the Bible tells us that Christ has created you, the Christian man, as a new creation. Listen, this afternoon, you either, you are or you are not. You are either living that in reality or you just say you're a Christian. I don't know about you, but I'm done saying I'm a Christian. I want to be one. I don't want to have a label. I don't want to wear a t-shirt unless it's Chad's t-shirt. Love it. But listen. Who are we? Is our faith biblically rooted and grounded? And are we, listen, understanding that uh, as men of God, our past has been annihilated by the cross of Jesus Christ. Stop going back to your past. Stop defaulting to your past. It's dead. Your past is gone. Jesus died on the cross to erase your past from you. Today, Franklin Graham said that about being men of God regarding the past. Christ died for the sins of our past. He's given us the victory. You're dead to that world. If you're a Christian this afternoon, you remember what you've done in the past, but you have no appetite for it anymore. That's a mark of the Holy Spirit. Listen, if, you're, if you claim to be a Christian today and you still love your past, you need to become a believer. You need to stop goofing off with religion and you need to get ready to meet Christ Jesus because your faith is not in the right one because the right one sets you free. Jesus Christ sets you free from your past. The Bible tells us in Colossians 3, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ is seated, the right hand of God. Is that the passion of your life? To be a man of faith and to understand, you know what? Man, what I used to be is what I used to be. I'm no longer that person. I have no stomach anymore to be that person. Is that who you are? I'm not saying we're perfect. I just know this. If we could be perfect, we would be perfect. We would choose perfect. In fact, the matter is you and I every day get up out of our bed and we've got to reckon something. And that is, this is a new day in Christ Jesus. My past is buried with Jesus. And he's given me a new life. That verse goes on in Colossians 3. It tells us that we're to set our mind on things that are above, not on the things of the earth. Why? For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, when he returns, then you also will appear with him in glory. Man, say amen to that. When Christ comes back, you will be practically transformed. I pray he comes today. Wouldn't it be awesome for us to hear a trumpet blast? According to the Bible, and we get caught up, the Bible says he's going to come at a time when he's going to interrupt the generation. I pray that this is the generation that interrupts us. It's going to be great. 
Is that your hope? Are you excited about that? To be a man of faith and realize that Christ could come back today. I tell you what, it had changed the way we relate to our kids. It had changed the way we relate to our wives. Jesus is coming. I'm not bound by my past. Number two, under this point, by faith we understand that the present, the present is won by Christ. The Bible says in Romans 13, 11, and do this, knowing the time that is now high time for you and I to wake up out of our sleep. For our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. You know the sins that pop in your head? The imagination pops in. Remember, you might hear her name. You might hear that song. You might go down that street. Or you, whatever it is. And the past comes up in the present. And in that moment, you're going to reckon yourself dead. Meaning, and I know that there's some non-Christians in here. You say, what do you say, reckon yourself dead? I know that's a that's christian thought. Stop, stop, stop. you got to read the Bible a few times before you get this. It's, it means this. That Jesus Christ has come into my life. I know it. I'm not into the, into the religious side of it now. I'm into the relational side of it. He's changed the way that I think. And when the old life tries to rear its head into my present day life, it's that moment for me to say, wait a minute, that's not what I choose. It's not right. It's offensive to God. I'll have nothing to do with it. And I'm going to take that thought and I'm going to put it out of my life. And listen, Christian man, Christian, young man, old man, all of us, fight. If you're a man here today and you're confused, fight. <laughs> take those thoughts, captain, and get them out of your life. Fight. And stand for what's right. Do what's right. Because listen, this is how we're going to win the present moment. The Bible says there in Romans 13, 13, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry or in drunkenness or in lewdness or in our lust, nor in strife or envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and no longer make provision for your flesh. If you have a problem, Christian, dealing with alcohol, don't go into a bar to get a drink. Don't look at the billboard that's got that enticing image of that bottle. Gird up yourself. Fight. Because you're a Christian man. You may have a non-Christian friend who invited you to this conference. The greatest thing you can do for your non-Christian friend is for you to show him in the reality of your Christian life what it is to fight. Chad just talked to us about fighting. I have a U.S. Marine Corps sergeant at our church, except Christ, after coming back from Iraq, four tours of duty, came back from Iraq, and uh, he accepted Christ, and a month later, he stopped me in the courtyard, and he said, you know what, when I was in Iraq, I could see from what direction the enemy was shooting at me. He said, I've been a Christian for a month, and the hardest thing is that the enemy shoots from directions you can't see. He said, listen, it was harder to be, it's harder these last 30 days than it is to be deployed into our rack. You know what that man articulated? What it is to be a real Christian in the fight. This nation is done with spectator Christianity. Listen, the mega church movement, all of this stuff, what does it accomplish? Our nation is further away from Christ today than at any other time. We talk about revival. We need to stop talking about revival. Listen, I'm going to lay this up. I never said this before. I prayed about it. We all talk about revival because we want to see revival happen. And it dawned on me, the Lord, I think, impressed it upon my heart. Stop talking about it and act like it's happening. Now, the sound of your applause, that was God speaking, and it wasn't me. Huh? Stop talking about it and act like it. God wants to move. We're right now in Southern California. You should do this, the spiritual history of California and Southern California. The heritage that we have in Southern California, let alone California. Did you know at the same time in our nation's founding on the East Coast of America, there was a great awakening taking place? And everybody reads about this and knows about this. Little People know that on the west coast of America, of all things, the gospel was being preached. Go and read the history of it. The gospel was being preached by a bunch of Catholics. Father Sarah and the missions in 1772 and 1776. God was moving on both sides of the continent to save a nation. The gospel was being preached. How many of you have ever been to Dana Point, California, right down here? 
you know who Dana, you know, you know what Dana's pointing to? You know who Dana is? Henry Dana. Harvard Law student, attorney, Henry Dana. When you go to the harbor, he's he's made out of bronze, he's standing on a rock, and he's holding a book and he's pointing at Dana Point. Henry Dana had the Bible. When he got off of that whaling ship in Southern California, he saw the California native Indians lost and barbaric, and he began to preach the gospel to them. Right now in South Orange County, he's holding a Bible and he's got his finger outstretched and he's pointing toward the mainland. And Dana Henry, Henry Dana brought the gospel. We have a great heritage. I believe God is not only not done with Southern California, God's not done with California. I'm filled with optimism. And it can start right here in this place today. If we as men have faith, rise up and realize that we can live our lives with Christ boldly, without fear, none of God. Not condescending, not arrogant, not filled with pride, men of God who serve their wives, serve their daughters, serve their sons, serve their communities. I tell you what. This state would completely, I believe, be turned right side up quick. Twelve people turn the world right side up. Imagine what many thousands of men could do if we were unleashed out of this building today. And then what is the faith regarding our future? Faith regarding our future. We have, the Bible tells us that for the believer, you, sir, you young man who trust Christ, did you know all of this life that we're living according to the Bible we're just getting started? You know what really launches our future? Read your Bible carefully. Jesus said, if a man were to die, believe it in me, yet shall he live. Did you know what launched of our future is the moment of our death? Hey, listen, when you came out of your mom, you came into a whole new world. I'm sure back in those days, when you're locked up inside there, you're probably thinking, hey, nine months is here. Nine months, wonderful, tropical environment. 98.6, it's wonderful. I don't even, I get fed. It's amazing what a world, and then all of a sudden your mom's having contractions, you, and your room gets real small, and out you come out of your mother, and uh, just to welcome you in the world, the doctor gives you a slap, and uh, that's the beginning of trials, and, and, and you think this is life. You think this is life. Isn't it amazing? Jesus said that every one of us, Jesus said in the Bible, unless you're born again, you'll not see the kingdom of heaven. Have you been born a second time? Now, I know many of you accepted Christ an hour ago or two with Franklin Graham. Good news. But I'm talking to the believer right now. You may be a believer, but are you born again? Have faith regarding your future. Get excited about it. Number two, we need to look at this. It's not only faith, it's hope. We're going to need to be men of hope. Why is America today so filled with hopelessness? Listen, the last three years, the American economy has set world's records, and the American economy is stronger than it's ever been in our nation's history. You would think with all the stuff we're buying and all the homes we've got and all the cars and airplanes and whatever you do and all the shoes, I don't know, whatever. If you're poor in America, you're rich than most people in other countries. Did you know that? So why, is, why are people killing themselves? Why is suicide on the rise? Because material blessings cannot bring you hope. Only Jesus can bring you hope. And a lot of Christian men today, listen, you, have, you hear about pastors committing suicide. The world has hit them. Things have knocked them off balance. And we begin to think, man, if pastors commit suicide, there's no hope for me. Oh, no, 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 no. Listen, the focal point is the same for all of us. God's word is true. He cannot lie. He will fulfill everything that he's promised. Hang on to his word. When we get our eyes off the word, we get swallowed up with the challenges of this world and we lose hope. The moment a person loses hope, they die. Why is this the case? Because you and I live in a system now that we've introduced into our lives. And that system is a system of fear. We look more often to how many likes we might have on Facebook pages than the reality of our Christian lives. Somebody befriends you and you take it personally. You don't even know that person. <laughs> hey, let me give you some advice. I'm on Facebook and that stuff. I know what I want to say. I go on, I say it. I hit return, I walk away. People tell me, do you see the stuff they're saying about you on the internet? Nope, and don't tell me. <laughs> it doesn't matter. To know the truth, be 
Jesus, and you've heard it today. Jesus is the truth, and he'll set you free with that truth. And you don't need to worry about the world liking you or not liking you. Hey, heads up. Jesus said if you're a friend of the world, then you're not a friend of God. That doesn't mean you're so about this supposed to be an idiot. But it means you stand for righteousness. And listen, you shout hope. Men, wherever you go, tomorrow and on Monday morning, go give people hope. Ask God. Say, I'm going to do that. Ask God. Say, God, I heard the challenge. I heard the challenge to go out and give people hope. Faith and hope. Lord, use me. That's all you need to ask. Let God do his thing. Just let, let him do it. But we are fearful today. Churches, pulpits, Christians are fearful today because we, I think we worship at the altar of acceptance. Listen, if you've got Jesus Christ, you don't need a poll. If you've got Jesus Christ, you don't need some sort of a litmus test or check in the wind. If you've got Jesus Christ, listen, you are absolutely in a majority if you have Christ. You don't need to worry about people's opinions. They don't even know what they're talking about anyway. Only God knows what he's talking about. But God's opinion of you matters. And when you as a Christian today, you've got to remember, man, you've been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. That's a theological fact. So how vision you have. And then God wants to use you. We should all be filled with hope because God has a calling upon our lives. Every, how many of you are Christians? Raise your hand. Every single one of you are called by God to live out in love. Be men of God. Let them see our love. Listen, when we walk in love, the light will automatically happen. Listen, is there somebody in your life you don't like? Start loving them. You see, but I hate them. I understand that. Do acts of love. Seriously, do it. Target them. Target that person you hate the most. Start there. Start with the person you hate the most. Listen, here's the great thing. The world is dark out there. If we have the love of God and we understand it, that God loves you, you heard, my goodness, man, you heard Franklin Graham himself telling you that God loves you. How much more on Jesus says, I love you. He says, you go out there now and you be the salt of this world and you be the light of the world. Jesus said that when the world sees that, they'll glorify your Father in heaven. Read the fine print. In the day of judgment, when they're being carted off to hell, they are going to know about your witness, and in that moment, they're going to agree with God. That man was faithful in life, and I should have listened to him. And in that, the world will glorify your Father, which is in heaven. No one's going to get pats on the backs. We're not, in, we're not at home yet. We're not in heaven yet. That's coming later. I have one second. <laughs> Love the fact that Jesus is going to return. Love the fact that he's coming back. Listen, that should be good news. People get in arguments. Listen to this. People get in arguments. Well, you know, I don't believe Jesus is coming back. now. I think this is going to happen first. Listen, over and over again, he says, watch, be ready. You don't know when I'm coming. I can come in a moment. In a twinkling of an eye. The Bible says that at the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's good news. Are you ready to meet him? Are you ready to meet him? Let's all stand quick. 32 seconds over. Yeah.